world just changed. Rakuten and Cisco customer experience. The right solutions, the right technology, most importantly, the right people. Between ideas and invention, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Growing up, I always wanted to be helpful. I was inspired by my mother and how she helped my community. My mom would cook a lot of Syrian food. One day, she asked my brother and me to deliver meals to our neighbors in need. She taught me that when you help others, anything is possible. Even leaving my country to pursue a degree. When I landed, I was shocked to see the level of poverty. I thought, how could such a wealthy country waste so much food when so many people are worried about their next meal? I heard my mother in my ear, and I knew what I needed to do. I started taking surplus food that would otherwise be thrown away and giving it to those who would benefit from it. I could see the tremendous impact right away. I recruited some smart students, and with Cisco's help, we were able to build an automated platform to connect food donors to communities with food insecurity. Not only are we putting good food to use, but also can track the positive impact on the environment. With sharing Cisco's purpose to power an inclusive future, we've been able to provide over two million meals across the US. My mother is my real hero. She taught me that a delivery so small could one day deliver on something so much bigger. Between a small gesture and a huge impact, there's a bridge. My name is Uves Iqbal. This is my 13th year working at Cisco. I have the honor of leading the systems engineering team based out of Canada, but I was born in Karachi. Then I moved to Canada in 2000. Then I started engaging myself within my own community, which is the Canadians of Pakistani origin community. This is where I met with uh, Daniel Mark. That was very moving for me. He's the French Canadian who moved to Pakistan about 30 years ago to serve the deaf community. These kids, even their cousins, people around them, they won't talk to them because they think that they don't understand, they cannot connect with anything. So then I started using my influence in my community to get this story out we were able to raise 200,000 Canadian dollars to support these children. Now when the kids are going to deaf reach school, they're learning the sign language, they have more understanding of the world, they know how to use technology. So far we have placed 8,000 people to different workplaces. If you start doing something small within your own community, the easiest thing is look around you who is in need. Once you take the first step, believe me, you will see that one door will open another door and then there's so much that you can do that you will never stop yourself. That you're not just living life for yourself, you gotta always think beyond yourself. Between a life in silence and one full of opportunity, there's Oves Iqbal. Greatness accepts no lag, no delay, no excuses. It lives in the tiny space between milliseconds and nanoseconds, between memes and legends, between tears and tears. And when margins that small make an impact this big, nothing less than the speed and dependability of the Cisco network will do. My name is Casey Shemansky, and I am a content editor for our talent brand team. In 2004, uh, my younger sister Kelly passed away unexpectedly. Obviously, it was a very difficult time for me and my, and my family, but we came together. We realized we wanted to give back. I think what makes me want to take action is, is a big part of, of my upbringing. I think a lot of that comes from being a first responder family, and when others are running out to safety, my family was always running in. In 2011, St. Baldrick's found me. 
The St. Baldrick's Foundation started with a bunch of first responders and it kind of became a challenge between them and it was if you raise X amount, you'll shave your head and you'll go bald. And now they're the second largest private funder of children's cancer research in the United States. It pulls at your heartstrings and it gives us purpose. I would love Cisco employees to join me. I would love to have more bald heads on campus and, and on our WebEx calls. My sister, I think she's proud. I think she's, she's up in the stars and smiling down and just proud as heck that we've all kind of come together and this is her legacy. Between a family's loss and the fight for a cure, there's Casey Shemansky. If we're to build a bridge to an inclusive future, then getting healthcare to everyone, everywhere, is critical. Take rural Europe, where local doctors leaving for big cities is creating a medical desert. For patients left behind, many lack the mobility or the flexibility to reach critical urban appointments. The remedy, it turns out, is as much a technological marvel as it is a medical one. Meet Medibus, a state-of-the-art clinic on four wheels. But designing such a wonder came with its own set of challenges, taking everything Cisco knows about mobility, connectivity, video conferencing, and security into account. And together with partner Deutsche Bahn, dispatching it from the cloud to create a 21st century lifeline. Now, no area is too remote, no diagnosis or specialist unavailable. All because one company dared to wonder if the road to better healthcare could literally be the road that runs through town. That's the inclusive future. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome everyone to the marriage between Rebecca and Cameron. In the presence of this company, it gives me great pleasure to declare you are now legally husband and wife. Cameron, you may now kiss the bride. Between being there and being together, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. There's a world where every one of us is connected. Everyone, everywhere, where everyone is included, where everyone has access to information, education, opportunity. There's so much out there. There's a world where buildings are smarter, where automation fuels productivity. And our planet's health is as important as our own. There's a world where everyone is invited to participate, to contribute, to be bold. When everyone and everything is connected. That's really beautiful. Anything is possible. Good morning. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Hey, it's good to see you. I know, right? Finally. Loving those shoes. Only for my meeting. Morning. Hey, how are you? The company we've trusted to keep us working remotely is the same company we'll trust to bring us back together. Back safely, with features like density monitoring to keep everyone properly distanced. Back securely, with more resilient, more robust protection to block threats faster. WebEx, start the meeting. And back responsibly with touchless technology that connects everyone. So now, between a year of being apart and the joy of coming back together, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Okay, everyone, let's get started.
founder and CEO of Skybound Rescuer, which is an organization that specializes in the use of drones for public safety. How did I find myself in a drones for public safety career? It's such a new industry that it didn't exist when I was at school, so it's not a career that I could have aspired towards. I hadn't been given the opportunity or the correct information to realize my natural ability for understanding tech-based solutions, which is why programs like Cisco's Women Rock IT is so important because it gives you that opportunity earlier in life. So how did I get here? If you have enough passion for something, then you are the right person to take it forward. When your dream career starts taking you to places that you've always dreamt of visiting, it's an incredible feeling. Well, hello everyone. My name is Rebecca Chisholm and I have the honor of leading our networking academy for the United States and in Canada. Welcome to our Women Rock IT live broadcast and we're delighted to have you join us. Today, our guest speakers will be sharing their career journey and how they have turned their passion for technology into rewarding and successful careers in a couple of fields that might surprise you. I'd like to welcome our live audience joining from around the world today. By being part of our audience, you can access our free online courses offered by Cisco Networking Academy. And those courses include Introduction to Cybersecurity, the Introduction to IoT, Essentials in Python, Linux, and Entrepreneurship. These courses are a great way to add more skills to your resume, as well as try out the field of technology if you're not sure about it. Details on how to enroll have been placed in the chat window, or you can scan the QR code you see on the screen for details. I'd ask you to please hold your questions for our guest speakers until the end of the session. If you do have a question that pops into your head while you're listening, please post it in the chat window or tweet your question to Women Rock IT. Without any further ado from me, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers. I think you'll find them both very compelling. Allison Watson is the founder and CEO of Modern Health. With her company, she increases accessibility of mental health services for all. And I know with COVID and everything going on, that's certainly top of mind for many of us. Allison has been named to the Forbes 30 under 30 and Fortune's 40 under 40 lists. After Allison, we're going to hear from Dr. Anastasia Volkova. Anastasia is a TEDx speaker an Amelia Earhart Fellow, and an MIT 35 under 35 innovator. In late 2016, she founded Fluorosat, and since then has taken the company through a journey of agricultural science, so food and mental health. First off, we're going to hear from Allison, who's joining us from San Francisco. Welcome so much, Allison. Thanks for joining us today, and I'm really excited to hear what you have to say to us. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I really appreciate the kind introduction. Well, super excited to, to be with you all today. My name is Allison Watson. I'm the founder and CEO of Modern Health, and we are a mental health company for employers. So we work with employers to make it easy for their employees to get access to mental health resources. I'm very excited to be here today uh, to share a little bit more about myself, um, my background, and how the company got started. So with that, we can go to the next slide. So before we get into all the details about modern health and my background and what it's like to be a female executive, I would love to kick off today with a little mindfulness session. So if you're on board with this, um, I, I ask everyone to put their, their feet on the ground, let their gaze get heavy. We're all going to do this together. If you have your camera on, you can turn it off if you'd like. And we're just going to use this as an opportunity to do a one to two minute meditation to really get grounded before today's presentations. So with that, We'll put our feet on the ground about hip width distance. Your hands on your on top of your knees, on top of your thighs. Let your gaze fall heavy. And start to focus on your breath. Breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. 
Feeling your belly rise and your belly fall. And as you're breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth, when you're ready, start to breathe in through your nose and out through your nose. You'll transition it from breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth to in through your nose and out through your nose. And bring your attention to the top of your head. Let your head just relax. Your eyes fall heavy. Your cheeks droop a little bit. Let your tongue come down, get lazy in your mouth. Relax your shoulders. Relax your biceps, feel them just kind of droop in the back of your arms. Let everything just kind of get a little bit, a little heavy. Relax your elbows. Relax your forearms, relax your palms on top of your thighs. Let your fingers just relax. Relax your bum into your chair, into your seat. Relax your thighs, your glutes, your knees. Going down to your calves, let those fall heavy, almost just feel them drape behind your leg. Down to your ankle. Let your feet feel grounded into the ground. Relax your toes. And feel your whole body just completely relax. And in this state, just focus on your breath, breathing in through your nose and out through your nose. And if you feel your attention slipping away, going to your to-do list or anything else, just bring it back to your breath, feeling your belly rise and your belly fall. Getting grounded and centered into your seat in preparation for today's presentation. Now, when you're ready, start to wiggle your toes a little bit, wiggle, wiggle your fingertips, maybe put your head to one side, then the other, get a little stretch in your neck. Slowly start to lift your gaze, maybe open your eyes, staring at, at your desk. Try not to stare at the screen right away, maybe count to three, and then slowly bring your gaze up back to your computer. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for participating. Hopefully you all feel a little bit more grounded and centered. I know these days are crazy from meeting to meeting and staring at our screens all day. So we like to practice what we preach at Modern Health and, and try to do some meditations and mindfulness sessions ourselves. So I highly recommend, anyone can do it, Got those guided mindfulness meditations. I highly recommend trying one with your team um, in one of your, your next upcoming meetings. Well, with that, Super excited to be here and super excited to share a little bit more about Modern Health. So again, by way of introduction, I'm Allison Watson, founder and CEO of Modern Health. We are a mental health company for employers. And a little bit about me and my background. So I come from the East Coast. I live in San Francisco now, but I'm from Boston. And I grew up with parents as doctors, so I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Um, but mental health has been close to home to me for a number of reasons. So growing up, my dad had bladder cancer. That was actually my first time seeing a therapist um, and it had a huge impact on me and my family, but it was so taboo. I mean, I remember like sneaking out of high school to go see a shrink and never telling anyone about it. Um, and then fast forward to my time at Johns Hopkins. So I, I went to Johns Hopkins. Um, I was also on a scholarship there for playing lacrosse, a division one sport. And I remember thinking, you know, in, in arguably one of the top medical environments in the world, I couldn't believe how much there was a focus on our physical health as an athlete, but not on our mental health. And at least half the girls on my team struggled with mental health issues, whether it was eating disorders, depression, anxiety. I struggled with anxiety. And I, I thought, wow, there has to be, this is really when the antenna went up for me and thought, there's got to be a way for people to really focus on their mental health. We know that how we perform as, as students, as athletes, as professionals, plays a big role in our overall mental health. So I had a dream of always starting a company. I decided to book a one-way ticket to San Francisco about six years ago now um, to, to try to get a company off the ground. I was told I had to move to this place called Silicon Valley that I knew very little about. Fun fact, you don't have to move to Silicon Valley to start a company anymore. Um, a lot has changed in that time, and actually there's value to doing it outside of this area, but that's what I was told. So I booked a one-way ticket, and it was a disaster. Um, I showed up to San Francisco and within two weeks, I lost my job. My boyfriend at the time broke up with me and uh, my apartment flooded. I had nowhere to live. And so I really felt, you know, I, I laugh about it now, but it really was a moment where I felt I had hit rock bottom. I had uprooted my whole life. I moved across the country. I had no family or friends, no job. 
And I decided in that moment that I would go and find a therapist and put one foot in front of the other and do whatever I could to, to set myself um, you know, back on my two feet and, and keep going. And so I ended up reaching out to a number of therapists. And as I'm sure many of you know, the, the experience of that is not a fun one. And that's really when the inspiration behind Modern Health started is how hard it is to get the support when you need it. But I also realized while I went through that process that a huge part about mental health is having the support system when you are faced with adversity and having the opportunity to build the mental fitness and, and flex the muscle of resilience. So when things do happen, because if there's anything we've learned from year 2020 is that there is adversity, things do happen in all of our lives that, that put us at higher risk, how we actually work through them. And I'll tell you guys a little bit more about that. But to transition to share a little bit more about starting a company, you know, I'd say there's two big things. One is around having some unique insight into the future and having conviction on it before everyone else does. And so a big part of that is just being so passionate, so obsessed about this idea that you think about it nonstop all day while you're maybe at work or, you know, on the weekends. And then another big part of it is luck with timing. And so we we got lucky that we hit our stride at the right time in 2020, as you probably all know, has been a big accelerant for highlighting the importance of mental health. It truly has become a top priority for all employers around the world. And you see this here in this example chart where how often mental health is being discussed on earnings calls. We've also done our own research on this and you'll see some stats on the right, which just show employees around the world are saying they want support from their employer for their mental health. Mental health has become the number one cause of disability worldwide. So the number one reason that people go on a leave of absence from work is related to mental health. And so it really has become this top priority and we've had this big shift and inflection point this year with everything going on. So if we go to the next slide, I'll jump in and share a little bit more about the types of companies that we work with. So really this is, you know, what caused the light bulb to go off for me was that how we operate in the world that we work in today has really changed, right? Not that long ago, we didn't have smartphones. We weren't tethered to technology. We, you know, we, people work nine to five and they'd go home and spend time with their families and how the way that we operate the world we live in is very different, right? I'm sure we all feel that even more so right now being working from home and having our workstation set up next to our beds and our phones plugged in next to where we sleep. And there's the constant tethering to technology and the notifications going off. And so all of this means that the way that we work today is very different than we used to work not that long ago. And if you think about the rate at which technology has advanced and the rate at which civilization has progressed, we as humans look very similar to the way we looked hundreds, little and thousands of years ago. So I often say it's like we have a V1 operating system as humans in a V1000 world. And so how can we give ourselves the tools so that we can build resilience and thrive in this world where we have all the benefits of the amazing technology around us, but still take care of our own mental health? And so that was part of the inspiration behind Modern Health was how can we give companies the resources so that they can give their employees the tools they need to build that resilience so that they can thrive in this world where tech, we have all the great advances of, of technology, but also take care of their mental health and thrive um, with their own mental health. So we work with companies across all different industries, tech, retail, um, you name it. We work, we work with companies you know, around the world. We support currently over 150 uh, customers globally um, and you know, companies that have employees from all, all different ages, uh, gender, you know, backgrounds. And so we really believe that mental health and getting access is of course a right for, for everyone. And the way that the solution works is we really focus on the user experience. So one thing that I that I would say for people who are thinking about starting a company is talking to your users and making sure that you're building something where people love it, right? At the end of the day, it's your users are what will make you successful. And so making sure that the members of your product are people who are evangelists, they love your product, they couldn't live without it. And so what we built is we, we really focused on this user experience. We said, how can we make it easy for everyone to engage in their mental health? And a big part of that was how do we remove the stigma? So we built the solution that is focused on everyone, no matter where you fall in the spectrum of green to red. We believe mental health is a spectrum, right? And it ebbs and flows at different points in our life. Sure, a lot of us are feeling a little bit closer to the red zone right now, given everything going on in the world. Um, but the, the, the reality is we all fall somewhere on that spectrum. Mental health, very similar to physical health, is something we all have. So we really focused on building the solution through an app that people can easily download. They take a quick assessment. We use a clinically validated assessment, and then we've built this algorithm in the back end that takes these inputs. We ask our users what they want to work on. What are their preferences? What are their goals? We assess their mental health, and then we take all these data points. We run it through our algorithm, and then we uh, the output is we put together this personalized mental health care plan that meets every individual where they're at. 
So your personalized mental health care plan might look very different than mine, very different than someone else's. The idea is that there's no one size fits all here, right? So while some person might really want to work with a one-on-one -on -one therapist, another person might prefer to do, you know, maybe a digital-based app where they do an evidence-based program that helps them treat depression. Or maybe someone wants to work on mindfulness and they want to do meditations. The idea is that we've got something for everyone, whether it's mental health coaching, therapy, or digital programs, and we meet every single person where they're at so that we get the highest possible engagement in mental health possible. So let me talk a little bit more about the, the product that we built. So we built a product that's available via mobile app and also on desktop web. Again, our focus is on making it available to as many people as possible. And so we've done this in a way where we have our product roadmap driven by the inputs that we're getting. And so, again, going back to that theme of talking to your users, really making sure that you're listening and hearing from and getting feedback from your users and having that drive your roadmap. That is key to being able to be innovative and iterate quickly and always make sure that you're moving and making sure that you're building something that supports these people. And so what we've done is we said, okay, as we're getting gathering information and people are using our product, so again, whether they're working with a coach or a therapist, or maybe they're engaging in digital programs, and we find that a lot of people are engaging in programs around financial stress. We take that information and then we say, oh, let's double down and invest on in the resources we have around financial stress. Let's build more courses there. Let's build meditations around that. Let's get more mental health coaches on our platform who specialize in that. So really the way that we think about this is the, the data that we're getting is driving these new forms of care. We call them new forms of care. One, one you know, light bulb that went off for us this year that we found as a result of this iterative process where we're gathering information from our users was around community. And so we doubled down on that. We said, let's invest and productize what we now call Modern House Circles. And these circles are group sessions, live group sessions that are led by a professional care advisor. So whether it's a therapist or a coach, but a professional who then hosts this group community session. We found that people, when you know they're going through what they're going through this year, whether it's parents who are home right now with kids without childcare, whether it's someone dealing with loss of a loved one, whether it's you know the stress of all racial injustice, the election, you name it, right? People are faced with so many different stressors. They, what we found is that they really wanted to heal and work through these stressors in their life as part of a community. So these are what we invested in, these modern health circles where people, where people can join these group sessions and hear from others and learn from others and also lean in and get support from their community. So if we go to the next slide, a little bit of, um, here's a quick overview of some stats on modern health and how we measure success. These are three key metrics that we track. So one is around engagement. So we see now over 20% on average engagement across our global companies. So that means any company that we roll out, 20% at least of their workforce is actively engaged in our product, meaning they're either working with a coach, a therapist, consuming digital content. The next is around our provider rating. We're very proud to share that we have on average a 4.95 out of five star provider rating. That's our coaches and therapists. And then the third bucket is around global presence. So we currently have providers who are supporting em employees in over 30 countries and speaking over 35 languages. So just to, to touch on a few lessons that I've learned um, throughout this process of starting a company is first and foremost, find your allies. You know, going through this process of starting a company, it's an emotional roller coaster. There's a low to meet every high and vice versa. And it's so incredibly important to be okay with that and to be vulnerable and get the support when you need it. It's it's important to, to, to bring on advisors who you trust who can help you. It's important to make sure that you feel like you can get support from other people and that you don't need to have the right answer and you don't need to know all the answers. You're going to need to get help and be open to getting help along the way. And so that was really important to me was finding people and, and, and finding female execs who you know were advisors to me who were ahead of me and maybe let's say started the, their own company a year ahead of you know me starting Modern Health and really could pave the way and help share some of the things that they learned because everyone has to learn from someone, right? And so it's really important to being open to that and, and getting the support that you need. The second thing I would say is play to your superpowers. In order to start a company, you can have any type of background. You don't need to fit into a box. So if you're really strong in engineering or strong in marketing or strong on sales or strong on operations or strong on science, lean into that. Lean into that superpower, play to your strength, and then allow other people to come around the table who can, can excel in these other areas that are not your superpowers, and you can let them play to their strengths. And that really gets to the third bullet, which is surrounding yourself with the best team possible. 
At the end of the day, building a successful company is all about the team. I can safely say I would not be standing here today if it wasn't for my team. I'll, I'll actually take very little credit for the, the success that Modern Health has had to date. It is because I have, I've been so lucky to have such an incredible team around me. And really finding the, the these people that you can trust and finding a team that can help move the company along is the key to success. You're letting these people play to their strengths and you're supporting them along the way. So thank you so much for listening. Really excited to be here today. And I guess I would just close out with, you know, if you're struggling to figure out where to start, but you're really passionate about some idea and you want to take the next step, I really recommend checking out Woman Rock IT. There's all these courses available online. They're free. And they're really a great way to start to figure out where to start your journey in the tech space. Um, but thank you so much for having me today. Again, I'm Allison Watson and super excited to be here. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Allison, for sharing your story. It's really phenomenal and, and unbelievably timely, I would say, given what's going on in the world. It's inspiring to hear the differences that you're making in the world for people who who want you know a little bit better mental health um, and to destigmatize it because I think that's the name of the game. So please send your questions into chat. I'm sure Allison's talk prompted a lot of questions out there. So please send them in to us. Now I'd like to turn our attention to our second speaker, Dr. Anastasia Volkova. She's the founder and CEO of Fluorosat. Welcome Anastasia. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm really curious to hear how tech and agriculture come together. So Anastasia, over to you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And uh, thank you for the Cisco work, uh, Women IT, to, um, for having us today. Uh, as uh, Rebecca just mentioned, I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Fluorosat. Uh, and it's a company that focuses on agriculture technology uh, we infuse IT systems uh, in the most arguably data rich industry out there to make decisions uh, and making decisions easier. But first, um, I would like it to be a personal story and I would like to uh, share with you uh, some of the things that I probably haven't publicly shown before, uh, but would love with this audience. I was um, born and raised in Ukraine. This is a photo that I've uh, rarely referred to on public talks, but this is a view across Dnieper River um, on the island that I uh, grown up uh, cycling up and down, looking at the at the big vast um, open landscape, and you can see how green it is. Um, I moved to uh, to Kiev to study. Uh, uh, to study my bachelor's there, but actually quite quickly, I moved to Poland and also studied in France and ultimately did my PhD in Australia. Um, I can't tell you that this was all planned when I was uh, young. This was uh, rather a progression where I was looking for every next step being a better step and a further step than um, than the previous one. And that has been my, my motto in approaching things in life. Um, if you can make the incremental steps forward towards more challenging things and, and, and better things that you're striving towards, it may take a few steps, but you will get there on the journey. And now I live in LA uh, and I always wanted to see palm trees outside of my window. And I guess that's what it is. Um, and, the, and the weather is pretty great. If you're coming from uh, Eastern Europe or colder climes, you uh, certainly appreciate the, uh, the weather here. It's nice and, and, and warm. Um, one other thing that I probably haven't shown uh, publicly as much, but would like to share with these audience uh, of young women uh, is how my family influenced me. And it's probably the first time that I'm publicly showing this photo that is so dear to me. So this is my mom and, and granddad and grandma. And my grandparents passed away uh, now, but I want to tell you a little story about how, well, my granddad was a civil engineer and he actually had the office of civil engineering in the little town that I grew up in. and. Um, Mom, although she had uh, an education of the electronics engineer at the time when I was growing up, uh, she was already uh, one of uh, the directors in the mayor's office. So I grew up with her being this managerial type, uh, kind of a project manager, people wrangler, something between uh, PM and HR. Um, but she has very strong technical background. And if she needed to, she could, um, you know, change the fuses in the electrical board if she needed to. And I was so perplexed how this worked and how this woman was so super powerful. Um, but she told me like, look, I just had that education. If you don't see me doing it now, it doesn't mean that I don't know how to do it. 
And um, um, I saw Granny wrapping Granddad's sandwiches in blueprints that had mistakes. So he would bring these blueprints from his office, um, and there would be all this kind of wasted paper that we didn't want to waste. Um, and it was interesting that actually, when I think about it back, and it's so much easier to fit the story back to where it started, but I didn't think of them as engineers. I didn't think of my granddad and my my mom as being engineers. I just thought of them as people who knew how to build something. And I wanted to build something, and I wanted to be like my mom. I wanted to manage projects, manage people, create something. So it's a, a just a reinforcement that you don't have to want to be an engineer. Just like Allison said, you can be anyone you want to be. Um, but I wanted to, once again, uh, manage projects, uh, build something, and I went um, to National uh, an Aviation University in Ukraine to do my bachelor's, actually because they had uh, a program in English, so my bachelor's were, uh, was in English because I always wanted to uh, travel internationally, leave internationally. I, I knew that I would need a diploma in English, and it was uh, quite a technical degree. It was uh, uh, aerospace control systems, um, but it says control, so it's like management. So when I was joining, I thought, okay, that's what's going to be uh, what I will do. I will manage some things, although I started by managing IT. Uh, the next kind of IT um, step in my journey was joining uh, Euro 2012 uh, as one of the dispatch managers, like the person who uh, looks at a bunch of people, a bunch of buses, a bunch of football teams, and understands how the three of those uh, need to travel around the different cities and airports. And that was, uh, you know, only vaguely related to my aerospace degree, but I understood how to work in a big uh, corporate, being young, uh, how to manage a large team of people who need to um, execute on your plans and how to get that buy-in. So it speaks again to that winded path. Um, and then after Euro, so that was Poland, Ukraine, uh, I started working with Polish colleagues and understood, hey, well, Poland sounds like a, a great country to, to move to next. So I uh, got a scholarship to um, attend, uh, to do my master's at the Warsaw Polytechnical uh, University. Um, and when I was finishing that, I had um, I worked through a lot of my coursework um, very early on, and what happened afterwards is that I came back to Ukraine briefly, and actually, as a, a tribute to Cisco courses, I went to a local university that was giving a course during uh, like an evening course on entrepreneurship when I was already working and my thesis and master's was under submission. And I took this entrepreneurship course that taught me how to write my business plan and that um, helped me meet other entrepreneurs. It was this very one that you can take on your own right now online. Um, and I always wanted to once again, travel and live in another country. So I ultimately ended up applying uh, whilst I was I was uh, working out of my master's for a PhD at Sydney University. And I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship. And so I moved there. And this is where I ultimately saw lots of my ideas come to fruition. But when I was thinking of my career, um, I was um, not particularly interested in joining a really large aerospace company because my degree was in aerospace. Um, in a very in a very junior position, because we, as we already talked about, I was already in a managerial position for Euro project, and I knew what it felt like to create something big to make an impact. And I was looking in, inward, and in the same way that Allison was suggesting that you know you should look for that idea that that sparks uh, you. I wanted to create an impact, and I was passionate about environmental problems and how it could they could be solved. It's not that I'm a big environmentalist, but I think uh, there's just something wrong with climate change going in the wrong direction from where it needs to be going. And so I looked at those problems and understood that part of my aerospace degree could help address the data issues in agriculture that in turn could help solve climate change. Because if you start looking at climate change, you will realize very quickly that majority of emissions are coming from primary industries. And this is where I started putting the pieces of the puzzle together. My degree, my um, project management experience, my product building experience, and my passion for ag. And I started Fluorosat. Um, and it was, as Ellison said, it's all about the customer. It's, I, I haven't just started Fluorosat because I thought it was a great idea. Um, I talked to agronomists. I talked to a lot of them. Um, and I asked them, what is the, why is agriculture so inefficient? What can we do better? And they said, well, 
I'm just a small human that looks at such a ton of data. How are you imagining am I going to make better decisions if I can't churn and crunch through that data in an efficient way? So imagine these plant doctors who we call agronomists, they have so many different data streams and so many farmers and so many fields to look after. You just can't expect them to make the right decision and turn their attention to what's most important because there's no system out there that tells them what the most important is. And so we decided that we're going to build that system. And we call it an agronomist in the loop crop modeling and sensing system. Um, Fluorescence is the is the short name, but I want to show you something that um, I hope you will find as interesting and surprising and as I found when I learned these things. Every field out there is actually monitored by satellite imagery, and you can get weather data on pretty much any field as well as soil maps. This information can give you enough to get started with the modeling of what the crop in that field could perform, and if. Uh, some of you have heard this um, paradigm of measure to manage. In a way, you can use this information to predict what the crop yields should have looked like, what's the amount of crop that comes out of that field, communicate this information to agronomists, and then use satellite imagery, uh, airplane and drone imagery to actually understand what is the current state of the crop and how the current differs from my predicted so I can manage for that difference. And not just manage as this you one person, you involve all of your users, all of those crop, crop doctors to make the best decision possible. And this is how we've created Fluorescence. So it's an online engine that collects satellite imagery, weather data, soil information, tractor maps, everything that needs to um, be put in place for us to predict how the crop can grow and to model its optimal performance and see, okay, if in the optimal, this should be the yield, but we're currently observing that the biomass is lower than it should, we can correct that. We can help you where to put more or less fertilizer, when to irrigate, or when to go and look for pests and diseases in the field. Most importantly, user experience here is key. This might sound complicated as an online engine that crunches a lot of ag data, all it comes down to is a bunch of email reports and alerts to inform real people on what they need to do on a daily basis. This is actually pretty easy when you look at the workflow. In the same way that you can go to Google Maps and put a pin and get an address, you can get um, you can draw a field on Fluorescence and um, submit uh, the crop planted information saying, hey, I planted tomatoes in my backyard and can you model uh, them and look at them and tell me how they're performing. Moreover, you can actually use satellite imagery to tell what crops uh, are grown in each and every field that you can detect. So we're a global company. Our customers in, in four, are in 14 countries um, and we monitor more than 10 million acres. So we really help people move the needle of this is how my crops are performing. This is what the regional average, what can I do better? And with that, we surface this information in internal dashboards where they can come together for meetings and make decisions uh, around how all these fields with potatoes and alpha, alpha and wheat crops are performing in Washington. But more importantly, on a daily and weekly basis, we provide these super straightforward, informative, insightful emails, email reports and alerts. Hey, agronomist, out of your farmers, this one needs help this week. Hey, out of all of your potato or tomato or wheat fields, these are the ones that might be struggling. Please go and check them out. So when we peer into uh, a, a report here, what we will see is in the satellite image of this potato field, fluorescence engine detected early uh, stress. And we were sending the agronomist to have a look. Maybe they didn't have the time, maybe they missed the alert. And one month later, um, what happened was that there was pretty significant damage that occurred in that field, the disease spread, and you could have avoided that if they were able to attend to, uh, to this alert very early on. This might look like strange maps you've never seen before, but think about it. This is a 100-acre potato field. This is enough to feed your family for a, a, more than a year. And if you lose 10% of that field, this really can tell you something about why the uh, prices on uh, specialty commodities or you know uh, some um, uh, 
uh, perishable produce like potatoes can go up and down um, if uh, people do not have this information to attend to it at the, at the right stage. Not only this is good for farmers, this is actually important financially for them as well as for us as users and environmentally. So if we try to dissect this report and put some weight and dollar weight into this, if you start looking at what we're suggesting here and what are the issues that the report has found, this 10% yield loss would translate into $6,000 of loss. Finding that early on at the first sign of stress gives you a chance of fixing that, addressing that. In the same way that if you feel that you might get a cold and you do something about it at that early stage, it might help. If you do not get to it up until later and the symptoms are more developed, you will have to suffer through whatever is the recovery that you will face. Also, if you think of agriculture being this, um, you know, glorified industry where everyone has a small field and can look at every plant, this is actually not the case. We are in the modern world. It's industrialized. It's massive fields. In this case, we actually detected a planter error. It's a tractor that plants uh, crops um, before in the beginning of the season that was not detected. Um, and we were able to quantify it. And these types of errors, um, when the uh, agronomist and the farmer are later on trying to relate, why is my yield so low? Uh, and what could have they done? They actually could have replanted if this information is uh, was available to them early on. And for us as consumers, we often worry about application of fertilizer and chemicals in modern agriculture. And we wanna make sure that that is remaining in check. Well, the way that you can think about it is in the same way that we sometimes need to change our diets and take supplements, fields and soil is exactly the same. It doesn't necessarily can, it, it can't renew all the nutrients by itself. It might need some help if we're still pushing it for productivity. In this particular area, we quantified and lined out um, the area in the field where the soil salinity was very really high. And the farmer can send the tractor just in that area and apply um, the products that will lower the salinity so that they can grow crops that are more, uh, that are probably intolerant to that salinity level. All it comes down to is less fertilizer and chemical in every field if you get the right data to support your decisions. Um, so just to wrap up, um, agriculture can be done from space. It's probably the most scalable and environmentally friendly way to do it. It still involves people on the ground and user experience is king. And for them, they don't want to, just like you log into 15 million platforms, they want an email that tells them exactly what to do. Personalization and field per field history, just generally in apps like modern health and apps like Fluorosat, you see a trend. Modern businesses are about personalization and data crunching and understanding each particular case in its own way and how to help it. So if you're aspiring, to create a business that does something good for the environment, for the people. Don't think that you need to be some kind of genius. You just need to go and talk to people whose problems you want to solve and really try hard and try as much as it needs to be done until you actually succeed. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Anastasia and Allison. We've had a lot of questions come in, um, both your presentations. What struck me is that you've addressed both our external world with food and environment and our internal world with mental health. And I think health and food are two critical aspects of our humanity. And so thank you for addressing both of them. I'm gonna ask you a general question for each of you. And then we have some specific questions for you based on your expertise in your app. But the general question I'm gonna ask first, and Allison, I'll go back to you first. What was the biggest hurdle that you've had to overcome as a woman in the field of technology? Thanks for asking, Rebecca, and thanks for the kind words. Um, you know, there's a lot, a lot to pick from. I think the biggest part is really knowing that, and I and I spoke about this in my presentation, but knowing that it's okay to play to your strengths and not feeling like you have to fit into a box, right? And so everyone has different strengths, and the reality is we're not all perfect and we're not, you know, we're not the expectation is that we don't know the answer to everything and just being really humbled in that ap approach and being able to be vulnerable. So for me, it was, you know, in the early days when you're, whether you're pitching to an investor or you're just trying to get the product off the ground, 
being open to knowing when you don't have the answer and asking for help and really raising your hand. And so I think for me, um, I learned pretty quickly in that regard, but it was around knowing that it was okay to not have the answer and to be able to raise your, your hand and, and ask for help, even when it feels like a scary thing to do. Thank you, Allison. Good, good point and good lesson for all of us, I think. Anastasia, I'd like to ask you the same question. What's been the biggest hurdle? I don't think of agriculture as being an especially female-centric business, at least not in big ag, right? We might be the farm women farmers in the field, but in starting your own company in agribusiness, what was your biggest hurdle, do you think? Yeah, Rebecca, you're definitely spot on in terms of it's not a particularly female-friendly profession. But to be honest, I was kind of just blunt enough to think that I was doing the technology part of it rather than trying to go into the business of farming, which is quite stigmatized. And, you know, farmer fathers are inheriting the farm and then granting it to farmer sons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I was uh, facing probably more hurdles in the area that Allison spoke about, so capital raising and getting your business off the ground. As you can see, Fluorosat is grounded uh, on a lot of science and technology. And whilst I had insight into part of it, which is remote sensing, kind of that satellite tie-in, I did not have a degree in agriculture. I didn't know how to do the modeling of crops and what are the photosynthetic processes. But I had the passion to solve the problem. And I said, we're just going to, going to work through these hurdles. And something that I needed to be probably more uh, okay with is the fact that my strength was in tying things together and finding the right partners and finding the right IP, the right modeling to uh, contract out of research institutions. We didn't have to do it all in-house, but it felt like we had to. And so I think the big lesson here is it's your conviction and, and you will do it to that conviction and do not feel like there is this external expectation of being any different in the same way that Alison was saying, you don't have to be a modeler, an engineer, someone with incredible insight, but you have to have a relation to that problem that gives you an edge and will keep, keep you going. That is an important point. Like it, it will be hard. There'll be highs as well as deep lows. And what will keep you going? Is there a motivation? Because you can't embark in the, in, the, in the business journey otherwise. So I would say if you can play to that motivation and worry less about what particular skills you need to have and you're willing to go and kind of outsource them, that, that would have solved for those problems I experienced early on. Thank you, Anastasia. So I heard you both say play to your strengths, right? We all have different strengths. So for all the young women out there, look inside yourself and figure out, A, what your passion is, what drives you, what gets you up every day, but what are your strengths? And here we have Anastasia, who admittedly doesn't have a degree in agriculture, but she's running an agribusiness tech company. So good lessons there. Allison, a question specific to you and your application now. Um, mental health, as you said, is often stigmatized. It's not something that we have historically talked much about. And so what are the security concerns for a mental health application? How did you address that and overcome it with users? Yeah, it's a great question. So being in the healthcare space is, is one thing. And then, of course, being in the mental health space is a second layer of it. So the reality is all of this is just table stakes in order to build a company and a, and a product in the mental health space. So everything from being SOC to HIPAA compliant, GDPR, you know, these are all things that are table stakes in order to sell to businesses. So that's something that we had to invest in in the very early days to make sure that we were um, set, up to, set up for success. And of course, everyone's information is 100% confidential, would never be shared with an employer, with anyone. And so people feel comfortable being able to participate and leverage the platform knowing that. Thank you. Yeah, I know that's that mental health, health, health information is one thing that people are really squeamish about mental health, even talking about it. And so having confidence in the platform and being able to outline what the protections are, I think is really important. Absolutely. Anastasia, back to uh, back to you for a question specific to your application. And I'm, I'm going to blend two different questions that we had here. One of the questions is, is this technology accessible to smaller family farms? And then the, the adjunct question to that is, what's been your biggest struggle in your outreach to farmers? Yeah, excellent questions, um, Rebecca. Uh, I would like to kind of reframe those questions because we can focus on small family farms 
And by small family farms, it really depends on which country you are. Um, the, the, the small definition is very different if you're in Europe um, or like Central Europe, Western Europe versus Eastern Europe, Australia, Latin America, US. A small family farm in Australia or Ukraine or US or Brazil is the size of small European country. Um, and uh, the small farm in India is the size of a small farm in Netherlands. So it really uh, depends. I would say there is horses for courses. This uh, technology is accept uh, uh, accessible to any location and any size farm, but it does mean different data requirements. So there is uh, satellites that take lower resolution data, like 10 meter by 10 meter pixels, uh, or like one picture is 10 meter by 10 meter. There is satellites that take pictures 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters and even 10 by 10 centimeters. What that means is that if you're looking at potatoes or even tomato plants on my mom's veggie patch in Ukraine, then you need a lot higher resolution than seeing a massive cornfield in the middle of Iowa. Um, and it's just selecting a different data, st data stack. But importantly, the hurdle has not been reaching the, the farmers. The hurdle has been the agriculture data being the um, a non structured data. It's not like, you know, uh, for example, modern health ask you as a user to fill in your information. We can't absol ask absolutely every farmer to fill in all the information. They just, uh, it's, it's in different platforms that we need to go and get it from. It's uh, so-called messy data. Um, and the biggest hurdle really has been to adapt the platform. And we knew it from the beginning, but it's a big part of our work of inferring data, filling the gaps, using satellite imagery to understand what crop type it is, what happened in that field. Because don't assume you can ask people in such massive industries like agriculture, because we are working particularly in B2B, business to business, rather than business to consumer. Um, so reaching farmers with insights has actually been a problem of not being able to get the data from farmers. So we need to infer it ourselves. Great, thank you, thank you. Allison, a question coming back to you. And actually this builds on a question that, that Anastasia brought up kind of in our practice session. And it's, you know, we're, with COVID and everybody doing online schooling now and, and video games and TV and the news, the election cycle in, in the US and geopolitics in the world, I feel like I'm glued to my darn screen, you know, 22 hours a day. And so when it comes to mental health, maybe the last thing I want to do is look at another screen to help. So how are you overcoming screen fatigue, you know, that we're all experiencing while also helping to address the, the subject of mental health? It's a really great question. Thank, thank you so much for, for asking. And I'd say there's two big things that we're focused on at Modern Health. One is around building a solution that helps people thrive outside of looking at a screen, right, outside of the app. So similar to how there's apps out there that help you track, let's say, go, when you're going for a run or when you work out, we're trying to do something similar with our mental health, which is give people prompts, tools, and tips that they can then take to thrive outside of the app, whether it's you know how to be more connected in our relationships, whether it's how to be more present when we are with our kids or with our loved ones, right? These things that we can do to give ourselves the reminders and you know, equip us with the tools so that we can thrive and be more present and grounded outside of staring at a screen or, or leveraging um, technology. So it's really to get people, part of our mission is actually to get people outside of the app and to be, um, you know, to, to be more present in their life outside of, of technology. So that's number one. And then the other piece is around connecting to each other. So part of what's going on is in a world where we're more connected vis-a-vis -vis technology than ever before, there's an epidemic of loneliness, right? And that's really because humans crave authentic human connection. And when we're staring at our phones and maybe scrolling through social media apps and going through the emotional roller coaster of jealousy, happiness, sadness in a matter of 30 <laughs> seconds, we don't feel connected to other humans. And so that's part of also what we've created within the app is having an opportunity to feel connected, whether that's with part of a community in a group session, whether that's with a coach, whether that's with a therapist. And really what drives human connection is an opportunity to be your authentic self and to be vulnerable in front of another human. And so we try to simulate that with our app. And so there's two key ways where we're trying to build these connections so people do feel like they're, they can you know, authentically connect with someone else or thrive in their life outside of leveraging the app. And that's a core part to our mission and our goal overall. So, 
still fostering that human to human connection, but also not having to receive all my mental health from the app, but the app being a coach and a guide is what I heard. Yeah, yep, exactly. Okay, Anastasia, back to you for a question. You both are such confident women that I, I almost hesitate to ask this question, but a couple of people have asked this, and so I really want to kind of dig into this for a moment while we're on the topic of mental health. Is um, Anastasia, first to you, and Allison, back to you. Do you struggle with confidence? I mean, as you're starting your own company, forging in fields that, you know, maybe that are new to you, do you struggle with confidence? And how do you overcome that doubt or that lack of confidence? How do you push forward? Anastasia first, and then you, Allison. Fantastic question, and thank you uh, for the person who asked it. Um, Two-part answer for me. Firstly, anything you read, any senior executive level research, you actually learn that the higher in the kind of hierarchy the person is, the higher their anxiety levels because the pressure is a lot hot, higher and the number of things you have to keep track of is just maddening. And so when you think of the desired position of managing the company, et cetera, it actually has to a lot to do in practice with the ability to focus and know how to manage yourself and the ability to start in the company has a lot of course to do with the confidence levels but i would say my advice has always been honestly fake it till you make it if you know if you think you can do it you can do it just to go actually and do it and no one's going to give you any any better um advice and i my own best friend struggles with confidence issues and she is so smart i am just intimidated and she always feels like all these other um, male uh, professionals around yeah. them know better because they have higher confidence levels it actually is just an attitude and if you will learn that you to be successful you have to project confidence this is the way that our culture and society works and if you understand that this is new table stakes and males struggle with this issue not more or less than you do, exactly the same way. It's just something that you have to adopt, that mindset of let me confidently speak to it, and that will help create it. Thank you, Anastasia. Allison, over to you. From the, in the subject of mental health, how do you overcome lack of confidence? <laughs> Gosh, there's a lot to unpack here. I would actually say that for me, one of the key things in my journey of, you know, I guess gaining confidence is around being vulnerable and knowing that it's okay to not have the answer to everything. And and when you can feel like you can just be yourself, um, and and of course, when you're being yourself and you're authentic to what you know and to what you believe in and what you're passionate about, it makes it easy to to know that it's okay if you don't have the right answer to everything. And it's okay to get help from other people. And so I would say a key thing about channeling confidence is also about leading with vulnerability and knowing that it's okay to not be perfect. No one is perfect. No one's expecting everyone to know the right answer for every company to be this, you know, perfect trajectory where nothing ever goes wrong and it's all smooth sailing. Um, you know, careers are are hard and, you know, work is hard and starting a company is hard and it's okay. Um, and so just being okay with that. And I think another key part for me about confidence is getting that support system around you where you can play to your strength and let other plays play to their strengths, which might be where you have blind spots. So for me, it was really about building a team where I knew that every single executive that I hired was a thousand times better at what they do than I would be at their job. So it allows me to really trust them and say, okay, I can trust this person. I can have this great team around me. That instills confidence in me because I'm so confident in them. And that allows me to play to my strengths. And I don't feel like I have to lean into these other areas where maybe I'm I'm weaker. And another key thing I would say is just having you know faith in yourself. And part of that comes from whether it's mindfulness and having time where you can really sit with your thoughts and know you know who you are and, and where your strengths are and feeling like you can lean into that. That's something that I practice with. I have a therapist. I have an executive coach. I've got a couples therapist. I, of course, lean into all these different areas of my life because it's so important to me. But the more that you you know, address different areas where you have maybe have questions about yourself and where you can lean into it helps build that confidence because you just feel more grounded with yourself. And so I think really, you know, investing in those different areas of your life and just self-discovery also just naturally helps build more confidence as well. 
Those were both great. Those were great answers from both of you. And what what I took away from that goes back to the know yourself, know your strengths, um, be confident. You know, if you don't, it's OK not to know all the answers. Right. I mean, Anastasia is in the field of agriculture and her degree is not in agriculture. Right. And so finding those resources and finding people around you that can help, um, which leads me, I think, to our last question, which is. How do you how did you find mentors along the way? How did you identify that person that could help you? And how did you get them to invest their their time and their energy and their focus in you to help you along your journey? Anastasia, I'll go to you and then Allison will end with you. So the question is around finding mentors and how they helped you. Yeah, there's a couple of ways of finding mentors. And I think I started by adopting the mindset of I need to have a mentor at every stage of the way because I want to learn something that I don't know how to do and it actually helps a lot with confidence when you learn how someone else does it it normalizes it for you like what does it mean to create a product what does it mean to talk to users what does it mean to create an idea talk to someone who's done that in the last 12 to 18 months and you will kind of normalize it for for yourself how to fuck them um, I certainly uh, have taken um, a first hat for the journey of uh, startup accelerators, mentor programs, uh, I've taken courses, and um, I connected with some of the people who taught those courses or some of the people who were attached to uh, grant funding programs or uh, investors later on, and I was looking for those who wanted to, who were leaning in naturally, who I had not, uh, who I didn't have to ask twice for support. He would say, hey, let's schedule that time and prepare this and that, and I would be, um, be as open as, as possible and not playing confident with, you know, with your coach, with your mentor. You need to play confident with people you need to convince to buy into your idea, but you, of course, need to know yourself and understand what type of help you need and identify the people who've done it recently in a kind of a state of an idea on the industry where you think it's applicable for you. And for me, that range from grant advisors to my board members later on, but first startup mentors and startup accelerators. Um, and of course, fellow female CEOs, someone who's in the same field, uh, just a little bit further down the track in the journey. Uh, there's nothing like coming together and talking about these things. And, and um, the problems are everyone's facing the same problems if you um, if you look at a specific industry, a specific stage of the company. So it's just uh, gives you great strength to normalize the situation for you. You're not alone. You're not, a, you don't have to be in your head. You can reach out and get the support of people who have just dealt with the same issue like yesterday, like a year ago. And uh, that will give you a lot of confidence as well as ideas how to solve it. Thank you, Anastasia. And Allison will end with you on the question of finding mentors. It's a great question. I think. Um, there's a few things. One is around finding, trying to find someone who can be a mentor to you who's, let's say, a year or two ahead of where you are in your career, where you want to be. So for me, when I was first starting Modern Health, I was lucky enough to have some amazing av advisors around me and some pretty incredible women um, who had started companies actually in the benefit space who really helped paved the way for me. And so I feel similar to them about paying it forward and helping other women. But they, you know, leaned in without asking anything in return. They helped me you know, put a business uh, deck together. They helped me practice for, uh, you know, applying to Y Combinator and getting into that accelerator program. They helped me all, you know, every step of the way because they had just gone through it and it was fresh in their mind and they had learned from their experience and felt they could share that with me. And I feel like that has stayed true to me throughout my entire experience of running a company is finding someone who's about a year or two ahead of where you are in your trajectory so that they can help coach you on things that they've learned that are relevant. Um, and then the other is around finding folks who, of course, have, you know, if you if you are starting a company or if your goal is to be X, Y, Z in your career, to find someone who has done that and who is a role model to you and and ask for help. It's OK, again, to ask for help. I was very lucky that my husband is an entrepreneur as well. He's on his second company. And so, of course, you know, played a big role in, in paving the way for me and helping share things that he learned throughout his experience. And I certainly would not be standing here today if it wasn't for his help as well. Um, and so I think it's about finding people in your life who have gone through something similar, or who, you know, have achieved things that you aspire to achieve and, and being vulnerable and asking them for help. Um, and you'd be surprised. There's a lot of people out there who, who are willing to pave the way and to pay it forward and, and to help others as well. 
Thank you, Thank Allison. You. Um, so I, I heard, make sure we ask, right? Have confidence, but ask. It's okay to ask for help. And um, I think there, there's a renewed focus on women helping other women and mentoring. So just ask, right? Have the confidence to ask. I want to thank you both, Allison and Anastasia. You are two amazing young entrepreneurial women who I think are going to change the future of, of our food, our crops, taking care of the environment, and also taking care of our inner peace and our inner health. So thank you for sharing your time and spending time with us today. Uh, to recap, all the presentations and recordings will be made available to all of our attendees on the Women Rock IT website after this event. Um, we've posted the event in the chat window in case you need it. If you'd like to pursue a career in IT, and I think both Anastasia and Allison have talked about, take a step, right? Try it out. See what where your passion is. If you'd like to do that, take a look at our free courses that are offered by Cisco Networking Academy. The courses are internationally recognized. Details on how to enroll have been posted in the chat. And on many of these courses, you'll get digital badges upon the completion. And so as you go along this journey of learning what excites you, learning where your strengths are, you can earn some digital badges that really can help you uh, further in your tech career. Your feedback on these kinds of sessions is really important to us. So please complete our survey if you would. When completed, you will receive a certificate of attendance for this. And so just along the line of collecting those badges and collecting certificates. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for attending today. Details of future sessions can be found by visiting our Women's Rock IT website. Enjoy the rest of your day. Don't forget to be mindful and a bit of Allison's meditation. Think of Anastasia when you go to the store and are looking for food and realize it doesn't come from that cellophane package. It comes from a field somewhere. And I wish you all a good, healthy rest of your day. Thank you for joining us. Take care and stay well. Thank you. I'm the founder and CEO of Skybound Rescuer, which is an organization that specializes in the use of drones for public safety. How did I find myself in a drones for public safety career? It's such a new industry that it didn't exist when I was at school, so it's not a career that I could have aspired towards. I hadn't been given the opportunity or the correct information to realize my natural ability for understanding tech-based solutions, which is why programs like Cisco's Women Rock IT is so important because it gives you that opportunity earlier in life. So how did I get here? If you have enough passion for something, then you are the right person to take it forward. When your dream career starts taking you to places that you've always dreamt of visiting, it's an incredible feeling. Growing up, I always wanted to be helpful. I was inspired by my mother and how she helped my community. My mom would cook a lot of Syrian food. One day, she asked my brother and me to deliver meals to our neighbors in need. She taught me that when you help others, anything is possible. Even leaving my country to pursue a degree. When I landed, I was shocked to see the level of poverty. I thought, how could such a wealthy country waste so much food when so many people are worried about their next meal? I heard my mother in my ear, and I knew what I needed to do. I started taking surplus food that would otherwise be thrown away and giving it to those who would benefit from it. I could see the tremendous impact right away. I recruited some smart students, and with Cisco's help, we were able to build an automated platform to connect food donors to communities with food insecurity. Not only are we putting good food to use, but also can track the positive impact on the environment. With sharing Cisco's purpose to power an inclusive future, we've been able to provide over 2 million meals across the U.S. My mother is my real hero. She taught me that a delivery so small could one day deliver on something so much bigger. 
Between a small gesture and a huge impact, there's a bridge. My name is Uvais Iqbal. This is my 13th year working at Cisco. I have the honor of leading the systems engineering team based out of Canada, but I was born in Karachi. Then I moved to Canada in 2000. Then I started engaging myself within my own community, which is the Canadians of Pakistani origin community. This is where I met with uh, Daniel Mark. That was very moving for me. He's the French Canadian who moved to Pakistan about 30 years ago to serve the deaf community. These kids, even their cousins, people around them, they won't talk to them because they think that they don't understand, they cannot connect with anything. So then I started using my influence in my community to get this story out. We were able to raise 200,000 Canadian dollars to support these children. Now when the kids are going to deaf reach school, they're learning the sign language, they have more understanding of the world, they know how to use technology. So far we have placed 8,000 people to different workplaces. If you start doing something small within your own community, the easiest thing is look around you who is in need. Once you take the first step, believe me, you will see that one door will open another door and then there's so much that you can do that you will never stop yourself. That you're not just living life for yourself, you gotta always think beyond yourself. Between a life in silence and one full of opportunity, there's Ovesic Ball. Greatness accepts no lag, no delay, no excuses. It lives in the tiny space between milliseconds and nanoseconds, between memes and legends, between tears and tears. And when margins that small make an impact this big, nothing less than the speed and dependability of the Cisco network will do. My name is Casey Shemansky, and I am a content editor for our talent brand team. In 2004, uh, my younger sister Kelly passed away unexpectedly. Obviously, it was a very difficult time for me and my, and my family, but we came together. We realized we wanted to give back. I think what makes me want to take action is, is a big part of, of my upbringing. I think a lot of that comes from being a first responder family, and when others are running out to safety, my family was always running in. In 2011, St. Baldrick's found me. The St. Baldrick's Foundation started with a bunch of first responders, and it kind of became a challenge between them, and it was if you raise X amount, you'll shave your head and you'll go bald. And now they're the second largest private funder of children's cancer research in the United States. It pulls at your heartstrings, and it gives us purpose. I would love Cisco employees to join me. I would love to have more bald heads on campus and, and on our WebEx calls. My sister, I think she's proud. I think she's, she's up in the stars and smiling down and just proud as heck that we've all kind of come together and this is her legacy. Between a family's loss and the fight for a cure, there's Casey Shemansky. If we're to build a bridge to an inclusive future, then getting healthcare to everyone, everywhere is critical. Take rural Europe, where local doctors leaving for big cities is creating a medical desert. For patients left behind, many lack the mobility or the flexibility to reach critical urban appointments. The remedy, it turns out, is as much a technological marvel as it is a medical one. Meet Medibus, a state-of-the-art clinic on four wheels. But designing such a wonder came with its own set of challenges, taking everything Cisco knows about mobility, connectivity, video conferencing, and security into account. And together with partner Deutsche Bahn, dispatching it from the cloud to create a 21st century lifeline. Now, no area is too remote. No diagnosis or specialist unavailable. All because one company dared to wonder if the road to better healthcare could literally be the road that runs through town. That's the inclusive future. Cisco, 
the bridge to possible. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome everyone to the marriage between Rebecca and Cameron. In the presence of this company, it gives me great pleasure to declare you're now legally husband and wife. Cameron, you may now kiss the bride. Between being there and being together, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. There's a world where every one of us is connected. Everyone. Everywhere. Where everyone is included. Where everyone has access to information, education, opportunity. There's so much out there. I'm going. There's a world where buildings are smarter. Where automation fuels productivity. And our planet's health is as important as our own. There's a world where everyone is invited to participate, to contribute, to be bold. When everyone and everything is connected, that's really beautiful. Anything is possible. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Hey, it's good to see you. I know, right? Finally. Loving those shoes. Only for my meeting. Morning. Hey, morning. 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 Morning.